Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. I uh, I was just seeing in the chat already, we've got people in Cape Town. We've got people in London, Exeter. We're all over the place. This is awesome. Um, first things first, bit of uh, bit of housekeeping. If you could, uh, in the chat function, change the little blue toggle at the bottom from hosts and panellists to everyone, and then everyone can see uh, where you are logging in from. Um, but thank you straight away for uh, for having us today, uh, for being here today, I should say. Um, I'd like to introduce my guest, uh, who is Dana De Gregorio. Did I say that right, by the way? You did, actually. Okay, that's good. I was thinking about that. I, yeah. I meant to ask, De Gregorio, it's a, it's a beautiful name. So yeah. Dana is, uh, she's the Global Managing Director at uh, Mesh Experience. Uh, Dana was the finalist. This was a, a, an award that caught my eye on her LinkedIn. She was the finalist of the Fearless Leader Award, which is uh, an award for researchers that are not scared to go against the status quo, uh, making a difference in their company or industry. She also told me today that she's uh, also won an award this year uh, called Insight 250, which again is a data-driven leaders uh, award making a change. Um, and actually, when Joe was doing his research, um, he was looking for the most accomplished market researcher, and her name just kept coming up, uh, which is lucky because today's Ooh. talk is on research. Uh, it's something that uh, I know is really important in the world of marketing, and yet I am guilty of not doing enough uh, or utilising the tools that I have available to me. Uh, and I know there's probably a lot of marketers out there listening today that don't do enough either. Um, so today we're going to have um, a short presentation uh, and then we're going to have some Q&A afterwards. And uh, if you've not been here before, then we take the questions from the Q&A and not from the chat. So if you pop your questions in the Q&A and then if you see one that you really like as well, then you can give it a little thumbs up and that will slowly go up to the top and we'll try and take uh, the ones that are most upvoted as a priority. Um, as ever, I usually like to highlight one of our partners um, who make sure that this community and all these sessions are free for you. Um, and today I wanted to thank Storyblock. So before working with Storyblock, I thought all CMSs were equal. Uh, so you mm. just go into the back end and jab away and you know, they all did the same thing. But then when we started working with Storyblock, um, I feel like my eyes have been opened to how a CMS can make a genuine difference to the sort of quality of the experience of both your team uh, and your customers. Uh, so if you're looking for a, for a good, or I should say a great CMS, uh, please do go and check out Storyblock and I will send a link afterwards. Um, also, big thanks to all our other sponsors, uh, Clavio, Braze, Impression, Exclaimer, Cambridge Marketing College and Redgate Software. We massively appreciate all of you. And uh, as I say, a link to all of them will be uh, in the follow up email. Um, that's enough of me gibbering on. Um, I know Dana's got a few sort of slides. I've got I've got a bunch of questions that um, that I've written down. I had some from a WhatsApp group that I'm in last night as well, which is which is cool. But I think Dana has uh, kind of a bit of an overview to start off with and then we can we can dive into some questions afterwards, if that's okay. Cool. Hello yes, to you. That, that works on my end. Um, hello, everybody. And yeah, I did throw together a few slides. I do work in market research. We love to have slides. Um, but I thought what we could do is just kind of highlight an overview. What is this thing? What are we talking about? We'll get to know one another a little bit and then uh, jump into some questions. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm also so distracted by everywhere people are calling in from it's so incredible um I mean I wish I was in half of those places and not frosty Rochester New York like I am right now but anywho yes I'm Dana I am with a data and insight agency called mesh experience and we're going to snap a little bit on market research because I saw James and Joe really went over the top in putting in the description of uh, what this conversation is going to be. And so I loved all of the connections to food because I'm a huge foodie. So hopefully, if nothing else, I'm gonna leave everybody a little bit hungry uh, today. And since it looks like most of you are on the opposite side of the Atlantic, um, it'll be a great snack before your dinner time. But let me just kick this off a little bit with who am I? Um, 
I got this note here that I, I'm bringing expertise to our discussion. I feel like the word expert is um, a little bit daunting, right? <laughs> because uh, I'm sure there are many, many experts here on the call. And yes, I have been in market research for a very long time, but I don't know that I call myself an expert. I'm still learning. It's still something that um, I'm passionate about and our industry changes all the time, just like marketing has. But um, I'm Dana D. Gregorio. I am the Global Managing Director at Mesh Experience. Um, we are a female founded and run agency. Um, I am really, really passionate about diversity in our industry. And so I'm very excited to be a shareholder and to run this business with uh, Fiona Blades, our, our CEO and co-founder. I have been in research, touching research in some way, shape or form or another for 15 plus years. Um, I actually started my career at a agency called Harris Interactive, which maybe some of you know, maybe you've heard of uh, Harris Poll back in the day. And of course, Harris was bought and sold by uh, Nielsen. I ended up staying with Nielsen. I did a, a lot of different roles there. I ran their data collection business, which I actually brought over from Harris. Um, I worked under the marketing cloud solution. I ran primary research for tech and social. But I always like to talk a little bit about how I fell into research because most people that I know in this industry, that's exactly what happened to them. Um, when I was going to college, market research was definitely not on the radar. I actually don't even think marketing was too much on the radar, to be honest with you. Um, so I had, by the age of 16, in my brain that I'm going to be a lawyer, right? Like I have decided I'm going to go to law school. Um, why am I going to law school? Because I want to wear this power suit. I want to challenge and argue. And um, it was the epitome of what it meant to be successful. Like me standing in a courtroom, you know, debating like a man, sorry, James and everybody else. I was really just excited to, uh, to, to bring different perspectives of, of an argument or of a case forward. And so that's what I went to school for. Um, I, I studied in my undergrad with social science and political science, and I really loved legal theory. It's something that I'm still, you know, I, I love to get into true crime. Who doesn't? Um, and then I took my LSATs and I bombed like really, really bad. <laughs> and I practiced really hard. I took all of those, you know, Kaplan courses and um, I nerded out over my summer and I did just, just did not do well. Right. Um, and I was super bummed and I decided I'm going to retake my LSATs in six months and, you know, try, try to give it another go. And in that time frame, somebody in my family who worked at Harris at the time said, Dana, there's this job available. If you want to, I can get you an interview there. You know, maybe you should think about, you know, paying off some school debt, um, you know, just before you take your LSATs again and go off to law school. And I said, okay, fine. Um, side note, I did take my LSATs again and I did do much better, but here I am 15 years later, still in my gap year, right? I never went back. Um, and I, I think that what makes market research so interesting and actually really close in, in a way to the field of, um, trial law is that you are maybe proving or disproving some points, some hypotheses. And so Although I'm not aware, I probably would have been a pretty bad lawyer looking back on it. Um, I have had a, a really amazing career um, for, for a very long time, being able to dig into data, to uncover truths, to help clients, help people grow. Um, and so that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm still really excited about. And if you talk to people in the research industry, you'll probably hear maybe not similar stories to that, but you'll hear somebody say, hey, I just kind of fell into this. I got a job and I fell into it. So anywho, that's a little bit about me. I'm in Rochester, New York, which is upstate and I'm closer to Toronto than it is to New York City, actually. I'm here with uh, two little boys and uh, and my dog in the background. So if you hear any barking, it's just how it goes, guys. We're in Zoom land, right? So um, I wanted to kind of quickly go over, you know, the purpose of market research and, you know, why is it important for us to incorporate um, into our businesses and into um, our day to day? But first, you'll hear me kind of interchange market research and marketing research. And the reason is because I really focus on marketing research now in, at my role in MASH, whereas market research is really all about understanding your general market, your consumer behavior, your competitors. So like the broader scope of things, 
Whereas marketing research is really all around your marketing efforts and, and um, how those really um, build up and ladder up to how customers uh, buy, how they relate to your marketing efforts, um, what's being seen, what's being noticed, what's being um, talked about. So a lot of what we do at MASH focuses on marketing effectiveness. And so that's what I've been doing for the past five or so years. Um, so I think that that's very relevant to this audience. Um, but just know that these things are a little bit interchangeable, but um, when you think about market research, you're thinking about the broader perspective. When you think about marketing research, you're generally thinking about things relating to um, marketing efforts. Um, but there's two really interesting places to start when you are thinking about how do I go about one, kind of even understanding market research and why is it important? I love in the beginning, James, of this, of your reel that you had Joe and Mark Ritson, because I know that he can be quite controversial, but um, I love watching his stuff. It's almost like I, a guilty pleasure, you know, eating like ice cream, you know, just like watching Mark Ritson just rip on everybody. But one of the things he talks about a lot is that as business owners, as marketers, as, you know, even research professionals, but in our business lives, we are super biased, right? Like we think that we know best, maybe because we know our product best, or we um, know some, uh, some things about the type of people who may use our product. But the reality is that if we're not actually including maybe our customer set or our prospect set into the discussion when we're growing our brand or when we're releasing products that we could really be um, taking some risks, right? Um, and we're going to talk a little bit later about intuition versus data. And, and I think both of those two things are important, by the way. But you hear a lot of businesses. I mean, we saw this during COVID all the time, right? Everybody had these big TV ads out there of reporting the customer at the heart of the decision making, or we put our customers first. And hopefully they did do a lot of that. But in my role, I've actually seen that often that's not the case, right? Often we're making decisions based on what we think as marketers or what we think as CEOs and business owners um, what is right. And some of those things could very well be right for your business, but they may not be, be right for long-term brand growth. So we have to really think about what we're trying to learn before we dive into um, how we're going to go about research, if we're going to go about research, or why it is important. But it all starts with that what. So there's so many different recipes to going about incorporating research into your day to day, right? And we're going to talk a bit about, um, you know, low, medium, high, I suppose we should say. But we have to think about what we're trying to learn. And we also have to think about it from the perspective of our customer base, not necessarily um, our own internal, you know, want or need. It's all about growth. But there are two different objectives that everybody has to keep in mind. And one of them is business and one of them is research. And we're always going to have both. And they're going to look really, really similar. But of course, your business objectives, they're more strategic. They're about, you know, growing your business. Maybe you want to increase your share by 5%. You want to decrease your churn by 10%. Um, whereas your research objectives, they really are more specific goals or outcomes of the research that you want to know. I want to know who um, prefers uh, campaign A versus campaign B. And all of those things feed back to the bigger picture. But these things are important because I think oftentimes businesses, um, they come with either one or the other, right? They may have an idea of what they want to learn, but they don't really know how to tie that back to business outcomes. And that's where having a really, really great either research consultant or um, research partner really are, is going to help. Um, exploit is not the right word, but exploit the findings and drive them back to ROI. Because at the end of the day, that's what senior leaders want to see. Um, that's what your finance people want to see. That's what your CEOs want to see. And that's what we want to see. We want to know what's making an impact. We want to keep doing those things. So 
where do we start, right? We've got our ideas, uh, we've got our questions. Where do we start with this? So where we start is we gather all of those small little intricate ingredients and we start to cook. And this is where I told you guys that I'm gonna make you hungry, hopefully. So let's talk a little bit about keeping your research simple, keeping it on a bu on a budget. And I've got this beautiful array of fruit here and flowers here because it looks really, really pretty, right? But if you can imagine you are a gardener or your neighbor has a garden or your grandfather has a garden, you've just picked all of these beautiful, you know, tulips and rhubarb and berries. Didn't really cost you that much, right? But it looks amazing. I should also note that I don't actually do a lot of research on the budget. So should, and that is because I, you know, I, I'm in a commercial role, right? Um, but there are so many different tools available for us. And the principles are the same. And I'm going to talk about these same principles throughout kind of beginner, intermediate, and advanced. But starting simple doesn't necessarily mean that you're giving up something. It just means that you're coming from a place of simplicity. There are a ton of different DIY tools available. Of course, there are survey programming tools like SurveyMonkey and Qualtrics and Google surveys. Um, but think more broadly about, you know, again, what it is you're trying to achieve. And I know that I just mentioned, we don't do a lot of research on a budget. And that's because generally marketing effectiveness and the types of brands that we work with, they're big companies, they're doing massive TV campaigns, right? But we actually do internally do research on a budget with our client base. So for example, we just launched a new dashboard solution. And what we really did not know we did not know going into this because we just started a new syndicated product. We did not know how our clients integrating, how are our marketing clients integrating um, the sort of dashboard data that they receive from whether it's Morning Consult, whether it's, um, you know, YouGov or any of those types of kind of syndicate providers. How are they incorporating that into their teams? How are they rolling it out? And how are they actually using it? What works? What doesn't work? We could have done a really big B2B survey, right? We could have gone to a panel provider. We could have um, talked with CMOs and marketing directors of, you know, medium to large companies. And I'll tell you what, it would have cost us a lot of money um, because talking to generally senior people um, through, you know, panels or through other means that are not within your network cost a lot of money. You've got to pay them for their time. You've got to program a survey. You've got to do the analysis. But we already have those people at our fingertips. We already have clients that we've been working with for quite some time. So sure, we didn't do a huge study, but we did qualitative IDI depth interviews with people that we knew, we trusted, and they gave us a lot of amazing insight and information inside of information that shaped the way that we um, presented our dashboard solution and that we created our rollout plan. And it's been ultimately incredibly helpful. So there are tons of DIY data feeds and tools at your fingertips, but sometimes the, the best DIY um, and simple solution is to just ask questions. Find somebody to talk to and ask questions. Um, I always like to talk about the kindergartner rule. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but it's about asking five whys, right? So I've got a kindergartner and I know he asks a lot of questions, um, but this is all about getting down to what is at the heart of what somebody is trying to say. So if you ask somebody one question, they may give you one answer, but if you follow up with a why, they may talk a little bit more about what's troubling them, right? And then you follow up with another why. So you essentially ask why five times. You know, you don't do it in a way that's like, why, 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 why? But it's all about encouraging a conversation so that you can actually uncover insight. Because generally, the first thing that somebody says to you is not always going to be um, the answer to the solution, right? Um, you know, you think about when I think it was Henry Ford. I'm going to get this really wrong. But when, if he asked people, right? 
what they wanted, they would have said that they wanted faster horses, but that's not actually what people needed. So really good questions and being inquisitive and allowing yourself to be a little bit vulnerable in continuing to pry and get down to the level of detail is the best way to conduct really simple research with sometimes no budget, right? Um, all right, so let's elevate our skills just a little bit. So now we're making like this tofu pasta dish, right? We're moving from veggies. We're actually cooking something. There's some lentils here. And this is where things like, you know, maybe pre and post campaign tests come into play. Maybe a, a gentle solution to brand tracking comes into play. But this is all about um, moving from potentially your DIY tools and engaging maybe with a research partner. Doesn't necessarily have to be, but let's just assume that we're engaging with a research partner. We are creating plans for um, for research measurement, for um, you know execution on a product or understanding a market. Um, there are loads of different companies partners and agencies out there to support all levels of business, small, medium, and large when it comes to executing research. And many of them are, you know, not necessarily egregiously expensive too. So keep that in mind. Um, generally, the most expensive parts of conducting a research uh, project are either in one, the data collection, if you are talking to people of a certain um, market, or if you're talking to B2B, or maybe you're in farm and you need to talk to doctors, that could be quite expensive. But the other is the time that the consultants are doing in terms of the analytics and how detailed those analytics can be. AI certainly has helped us um, in a lot of these areas because there are tons of different AI tools available to kind of scale research. There are AI tools for analysis. There are AI tools for sentiment. There are AI tools for, um, you know, scraping review sites or bringing in um, semiotics to, to the table. So there are still ways to conduct very sophisticated research on a budget. But what I would say is that when you are moving from the basics, when you are moving from wanting to, um, you know, kind of do some test and learn to maybe creating a program for your tracking awareness or looking at A-B testing, that's probably when you may want to consider engaging with a partner because partners, one, have deeper relationships with panel providers. They have the tools at their fingertips. Um, and although the DIY survey creation tools are, you know, they're pretty sophisticated, they're, they're, they're really great. Tools like Decipher, for example, or Confirm It um, can really do some very interesting uh, programs and really create a better user experience. And that will ultimately mean better data and um, better insight. And then finally, there's the master chef. And I've got these little macaroons because I heard they're hard to make. I'm not really sure. I'm not a baker. But uh, the master chef is really elevating not only what you've done, what you've learned, but maybe bringing in some additional expertise. Um, listen, we can make anything complicated, right? Like you can make the most basic of analysis, the most complicated analysis, because researchers statisticians, data analysts, I love them all, but we love to make things like super, super complicated. Um, so the, the master chef is not necessarily in how complicated your research program is or how complicated the tools are that you use. The master chef is all about understanding um, how to make, how to write the best questions, how to engage the right time, how to incorporate other data sources into your insight, not just a survey, for example, or a focus group. Um, how to host the best workshops. I love using semiotics as my master chef tool. And semiotics is the kind of anthropology, the form and function of language. Um, I've used this on quite a few studies and 
it's been, you know, transformational in terms of what I've learned about culturally why people are responding the way that they do. Um, and I've learned a lot about my own biases in the data from that. So Master Chef may be creating a giant segmentation. It may be creating a measurement rollout program for campaign effectiveness um, that includes, you know, MMM or uh, um, additional data sources. But it also could be just mastering the insight that you have and knowing how to bring it to the C-suite or bring it to the people that are making decisions so that um, so that we can really elevate insights and use it to extrapolate and grow your ROI. Um, couple things. I think that now for marketers in particular, this is a really important time to understand what you're measuring and how to measure it best. So when some of those master chef insights are necessary. Um, and the work that we do at Mesh is all around understanding all of the experiences that people have with brands. So you're paid, you're owned, you're earned, and putting it on one level playing field. Because we know it's more than just the paid advertising that is driving people to consider a brand or driving people to trust a brand. Um, and now we've got so many other ways in which people can in interact with brands. Um, and you've got John Wanamaker here in 1919 as the postmaster general talking about, um, you know, I know the half of my advertising is wasting. I just don't know which half it is. And that was in 1919. But actually, now we have all of these new tools as marketers, right? We have all of these new tools as tech companies, but that gap is even bigger. You would have thought that bringing all of these new ways of measurement um, to the table, it would have lessened the gap, but it hasn't because we've got all of these different ways that people can interact and come across your brands and your products. You've got you know, TikTok and socials and the metaverse, and you still have out of home and you've got your own channels and people talking on review sites. There are a lot of different ways that people are coming across brands. And we have to really understand, again, what we're trying to measure and what is the best way to execute on that. Um, but be beware, right? And this is going back to what John was saying here, because marketing is going to increase in terms of spend, right? You are all going to be spending a lot more money in the near future than you have previously. Um, global brands are going to be spending $4.7 trillion on marketing. That's just like blows my mind how much money is being spent. But you also have these traditional metrics like share of voice, which many of you probably use in your, in your analytics and in your planning. But it doesn't really include everything, right? It misses a lot of those touch points that we just talked about. And also on top of that, you know, we oftentimes as marketers focus on advertising. We focus on our paid efforts, but that's only really 30% of how people experience your brand, right? So we have to be thinking more holistically about how we measure and how we engage research and analytics to help us elevate our game. And that's essentially why we do what we do at MASH, which is all about moving away from what we push out as marketing to understanding what people actually pick up in you know, your human-centered world so that we can make better decisions, right? We can understand um, how your own channels are working versus your pay versus your earned. Um, what what we like to ask our marketing people often when we're engaging in a research project is, can you draw that pie chart of what you pushed out in terms of you know, your content or what channels you pushed out? Everybody can always say, yeah, of course. And then we say, well, can you draw that pie chart of what people picked up? And they'll say, well, no, we can't. Well, of course you can't, unless you're measuring this way, right? So measurement is incredibly important. And this goes back to having you know, again, a really foundational approach to research and incorporating that fundamentally in what you do as a business um, so that you can make the best and most informed decisions. Um, intuition versus data. I'll just click on just a couple um, case studies and examples. I'm not going to name the bank, although you guys will probably be able to, uh, to identify which bank it is since a lot of you are from the UK. But 
I think this was 2000 and maybe 16, but the CMO of a very large bank and institution in the UK was famously reported in the paper um, when being asked a question about trust. And he said, the question was, what drives trust? You know, is it is it your ads? And he said, of course, it's not the ads. Ads aren't driving trust. What's driving trust with people in the bank are people going into the bank and utilizing the service. And so we thought, because we're challenger brand, that's interesting, you know, kind of agree with him, but I want to look at that. And of course, we had retail banking data, so we're just inquisitive and pushy in nature. And so we went back and we looked at the data and we actually found that he's wrong. The CMO was wrong. Um, intuitively, he was talking about, you know, your in-person experiences, which don't get me wrong, they are very important. But when we looked at, through research and analysis, what was actually driving that impression of trust in the bank, it was the paid advertising. It was people seeing this very strong, you know, logo and heritage, you know, this bank being, you know, hundred something years old. And, you know, when you saw this black horse, you just knew it was your bank and you trusted it. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and so it, he was wrong. And this is somebody who's been, you know, in 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 the CMO position. And, and listen, he hasn't really made any wrong moves that I know of, but he could, right? If he thought about, hey, you know what? I'm going to pull my investment in paid and I'm going to, you know, put it in this channel or I'm going to move things around. He could be eroding some trust if he had made some different decisions. So intuition versus data, I think that, we are all inquisitively intu intuitive marketers. I think that's a very important part of why we do what we do. I think it's um, important for, for growth, but you also need data. And that shows why, you know, good research is super important. Um, I'll talk a little bit about an example of where research actually got it wrong um, because it's not foolproof, right? It comes down to, again, asking the good questions, asking the right questions, but we were working with a global client around a global sporting event. And they had done some neuro testing, which is also at the master chef uh, <laughs> category because it can be, again, quite expensive. But they were testing it, an advertisement that was going to be played during the Euros. And in neuro testing, the ad actually scored very low. Um, people weren't really into it. They were like, I don't understand what this is trying to illuminate. Um, and it, the, the neuro company went back to the brand and said, I think you guys should pull this ad and you should change the ad. It's scoring really, really low. We were working with the brand as well. And we said, actually, I think we should run it. I think you should run it at least for a couple of weeks. Let's see how that ad does in real time in real life, because testing something, you know, while you're thinking about a sporting event versus experiencing something while you're in the thralls of a sporting event can be very different. And actually this ad overperformed. It was driving consideration for the brand. It was driving brand love. It was, um, it was actually an incredible ad. I think many of you have probably seen it, but what was different is that in context, it was creating excitement. It was reliving and inspiring people to be really, really excited about um, that sporting event. It had loud drums. It was like, you know, let's get it going. Let's get it going. And and uh, in neuro, people just couldn't understand it, right? It was like, oh, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And looking back at it, you know, maybe that was the wrong research method to, to test. And of course, that client, um, they took a risk and went forward with it. And that risk paid off. So it was intuitive because... The research got it wrong. But I think, again, having really great conversations and trusting in what you were doing and having a little bit of data on the back end to say, oh, we can pull this if it doesn't work um, is always really important. So again, you know, we get things mixed up all the time because we're coming from, we have our blinders on, right? And sometimes our intuition drives us in the right direction. And sometimes um, it really needs to be backed up with data. And that's essentially what um, market research can help bring to the table when you are 
up against it as a, as a marketer or maybe making some bold decisions. Um, so yeah, so that is kind of how I wanted to level set all of this. I'm happy to just shut this down and take these questions. I hope maybe James, you're going to. Yeah, that was amazing. That's, yeah. that's really interesting. And in fact, even just your, your opener distinguishing between marketing research and market research actually kind of reset something in my head in terms of the, the questioning and, and, and the approach to, to research in general, you know, it's two, two very, very different things. Um, I, I have a, I have 101 questions in my head and I, I know there's going to be a bunch <laughs> in, the, in the chat um quite quite selfishly um I've been really interested to ask you about the sort of um you know the the business that we run which is which is very small uh, in comparison to a lot um each year Joe and I will spend a day or two and in fact now some of the wider team helpers um interviewing our community so uh, we literally set up 20 minute talks um, with a 10 minute break. It is one of the most exhausting days you can imagine from like nine till five, just back to back to back to back. Yeah. Um, and we we have a series of questions that we ask and it's all around kind of where our community are at, where they hang out, what their problems are. It's, it's quite sort of lighthearted in that sense. But one of the things that I always worry about in terms of that research is we get loads of really interesting stuff coming out of it that we weren't aware of, that we always put into action. But I wonder how biased uh, those results are because the people that are willing to give us 20 minutes of their time are usually the super fans in the community who just want to be involved in everything. And yes, we want more of those people, but it, but are we sort of like, the bias yeah. thing is the thing that really worries me because you know, are we limiting ourselves by, by speaking to those people that are willing to give us our time? And, and presumably that, that applies to any sort of research is that there's a willingness to give time yeah and, and answers um how do, is there a, is there a good way to yeah around? well it's interesting we get this question a lot um because a lot of the work that we do at mesh is a is on diary studies so we ask people to tell us anytime they see here experience anything to do with let's call it um you know beer over the next week and so a lot of our clients would say, well, hang on, you're kind of predisposing them to have these experiences, right? Yeah. And yes, that's true, but they actually don't know if the study is for Guinness or is it for Heineken? Is it for Molson? Is it for Budweiser? Um, so yes, there is bias that that exists there, but it's the benchmark is still, you know, a flat against all the other competitors. And we find even with our diary studies talking about a sample pool that the people who are willing to participate in more of a longitudinal type of experience, they are generally more engaged, right? Um, the people who aren't, they drop off. They drop off right in the beginning. It's something that the sample providers are, are, are still kind of weighing against. What is the best way to create that stratified sample set? So you're not just getting the overly enthused people. And you can do that from a survey standpoint by talking to different groups of people. You can talk to people who are on double opt-in panels, right? And then you can talk to general population, maybe through real-time sample or, or kind of intercept sample. That really broadens your net. For your challenge, it's very interesting because of course, you've got this really rich data source available to you. And your most engaged members are they're very important to how you shape your brand and how you shape your content. What I would also say would be interesting to look at is to look at other engaged communities that are actually not, you know, that have nothing to do with the marketing meetup, right? Maybe they are the CFO center or, you know, the bills mafia, like what are other, what are these other communities and network and research or and, and networking groups um, what are they looking for in terms of staying engaged and see what kind of cross learnings? Because if you bring in the other kind of best in class, um, uh, you know, groups or um, pockets of people or network communities that are doing it really, really well, I mean, you could find some really interesting learnings from from them. So yeah. there is there is bias, right? Um, and you may want to think about. I mean, I don't, do you do like an annual survey? 
we did it's it's more um we don't do like a, a survey monkey or anything like that yes. um it's something that we've we've considered and I, and I think we probably would do as the community gets bigger as well yeah um, and as it becomes more global as well so we've, we're finding that we're trying to understand like the american market is a is a fascinating one we've yeah. been we've been launching events over there and our kind of tone of voice that's resonated so well in the uk it kind of confuses the american market a little bit and it's yeah, and we it's, were talking about that earlier <laughs> yeah and it's like this positively lovely thing you kind of get the oh, oh so what's this <laughs> and it's yeah. whereas here it's like oh it's friendly and it's you know yes. um so yeah en enough about us though that's um that's really helpful thank yeah. you um We've got a bunch of questions now in the uh, Q and A, um, so I'm just going to take the take the one from the top from Amy. Uh, so that says, uh, "What are your top three free research tools that you think every marketer should have and use?" Mm. <laughs> hmm. Top three free. That is a good question. That is a really good question because again, I'm not always into the free DIY tools, right? Um, I, guess I guess you're getting data. In, I guess there's the tools which are research tools, but then I- There's so data sources too. Then there's data sources, yeah. So I, I wonder whether that- Yeah, that. I think the data sources are actually more important. Um, I would say, and, and I think a lot of people are probably are already using, but chat chat gpt right um you know our ai solutions there are some really amazing free ai solutions there's a website called there's an ai for that and it just kind of aggregates all of the different ai solutions and you can put in you know marketing you can put in research you can put in automotive um and it's constantly you know adding to that list and compiling but there are a lot of solutions that are quick and either free or very, very inexpensive. Um, the chat GPT plus, I think it's, you know, 20 pounds a month or something like that, right? And of course there are nuances and there are, um, you know, there are things to be, to be thought about in terms of how you use that data and whether or not that data is up to date. Um, you have to have, well, you should have kind of best in practice IT um, solutions at your at your organization. But I personally feel like those tools, um, although AI has been around for a very long time, have really, really changed the game for a lot of people. There are also tools in AI for what they call um, synthetic panelists. And that's a really icky term <laughs> because like this idea of like a synthetic person is like, I, I don't know, it's kind of creepy. But it's going to change the way that market research is done and the accessibility to consumers for um, marketers of all sizes of business, because in the future, there may not necessarily need to be, um, you know, double opt-in panel solutions that are costly. You know, if you wanted to do a very large study with thousands of people, you know, it's going to cost you thousands of dollars because we want to pay people for their time. And these solutions are coming to the marketplace and they are creating segmentations. They are creating really interesting um, pockets of knowledge and insight based off of AI algorithms and, um, you know, extrapolating people's behavior online. Um, so I think that that's another tool to be looking at as we're building our tool, our, our tool belt. Um in terms of free or very inexpensive tools. And then there's the survey. I mean, the survey monkeys are the Qualtrics um, or Google surveys. I mean, you can you can do free research with them. It's not always going to be amazing, but if you just need to get a quick job done, it's better than nothing. And they're very easy to use. They're it's really easy to program one of those surveys. And you guys should be doing it too, James. You should, yeah, you know, you should get those things out to people because just asking oh, the other thing too, when you're doing DIY, like just asking a few questions is better than trying to, you know, over-engineer something. Um, and I always find that qualitative, asking qualitative or open-ended questions are, you know, you'll get the most rich data back from that if they're phrased the right way. It's going to require more of your time 
to 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 read through and to to analyze but you'll be able to do more with that with that sort of data yeah and i think it's um so one of the things that i'm thinking as as we're going along is okay can we can we keep those uh those one to one type questions in place you know can brands is it would you say it's valuable to say okay well you speak to your audience on a one to one basis so speak to your customers pick up the phone to them uh, mm-hmm. survey them have a chat with them be quite qualitative in that in that sense but then maybe use ai tools and email databases with sort of quantitative research yeah. and then data from things like social media and that kind of thing to build the argument so that you've got a balance is it important to have both would you say i i absolutely agree and you know and the ai tools they're not foolproof right again they're not going to replace the need for human conversation. I'm really passionate about that. I think that if you want to know something, the best thing to do is to ask somebody, right? And you know, you're going to have a lot of biases in in any sort of uh, data collection. You just have to know what to do with them and how to avoid um, those misinterpretations in your analysis. But yeah, a mix of quantity and quality, or quantitative and qualitative, is really, really important. Um, and we still do, we, we even talk to the people that take our surveys, right? You know, we say, Hey, can we phone you up? We want to get your feedback. What worked for you? What didn't, were you actually really engaged, right? Or like, were you just flying through? How can we better improve our design, um, to get better outputs? And, and yeah, th- I think there's also like, we have bias against some, um, of the, the human conversation where people, you know, you kind of were alluding to that. You didn't say it, but, um, you know, where we're, we're incorporating one view or another, somebody who's more likely to participate in a survey versus more likely to just fly through because you're on a panel. Um, and, and yeah, that's true. But if you ask really interesting questions, if you make your research engaging and not just, you know, loops of grids and, you know, because we want to know everything all at once, you will get really good feedback. You will eliminate a lot of the BS and you'll get really interesting feedback. Yeah. So actually getting, getting people chatting is, uh, is a, is a good place for that, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we did a study a couple of years ago, all around identity, and it was a very kind of controversial study online because it It was more about um, qualitative results, but we asked a lot of qualitative questions in an online survey. And the reason was because we were asking people pretty personal things and we didn't know how it was going to go, right? We're like, people are either going to say, you know, yes, no, and then go on and on and on. And actually what we got from that survey was, you know, the most um, raw and amazing feedback that I've ever I've ever received um, on an online survey. And people were thanking us for asking questions. They were thanking us for an outlet to to talk about, you know, some of the biases that were happening with certain communities and how they were only able to show up as Latina with their Latina friends, but not able to do that in their college community. So I, I also think that asking the right questions is absolutely critical to getting amazing results. Yeah, no, that's that's super interesting. It's um, it's really hard to to kind of like, there's the there's the science and there's the this the human side and you know as as we said before, I think it, I think a mix is is definitely where uh, where we're going here. Um, one of the one of the questions that Lawrence asks is um, how do you measure a brand's like distinctive brand assets? So mentioned in how brands grow book, uh, can this be done cost effectively for small to medium sized companies? Well, I know how we measure this, and and this is all all around kind of ongoing ongoing measurement systems, right? And I think you can do an ongoing measurement system um, cost effectively. Now, one person's budget is going to be, you know, cost effective budget might look very different to to somebody else's. So I'm I'm, I'm aware of this, um, but you know, we work at Mash with 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 Peter and, and, and Les um, on, on a lot of different things. We work with work and those are principles that we bring into our, the way that we collect data, the way that we do analysis. And that's why it's all really measured around experience. 
um, we measure distinctiveness really through ongoing tracking. Um, you know, we understand, you know, the, the banking example was a really good, uh, good example to this there question is. you have. And of course that, that brand is, is very large, but it really showed how having a very distinctive asset, um, is what drives things like trust. So it also kind of goes back to what are we trying to do with these, with this distinctive asset, right? Like what are we trying to connect that with? What sort of image statements, what sort of, um, of, of ROI or, or growth are we, are we really looking for? And looking over time at how different campaigns impact on distinctiveness um, is something that we're always a big advocate of because if you look at like a point in time or look at a A-B test and you're thinking about, you know, is this driving trust or is this um, distinctive enough? It's not really going to tell you much, right? You've got to be looking at the long-term impact and what distinctive assets do to brand growth for both on the long term, but also on the short term in terms of of sales. So I would always be a good advocate of at least if you can't afford a, an ongoing measurement system like that, kind of quarterly dips, right? Where you're engaging with your research partner um, in an ongoing way, but maybe it's not continuous tracking. Um, there are also a lot of syndicated solutions that are that are available for for brands. Um, and maybe if you don't, if you're new to the space or if your brand is new to the space, you can still see what your competitors are doing. Um, or you can still see what best in class um, like products are doing or like companies are doing. You know, oftentimes we'll have, um, you know, banks, for example, this is a, this is not real, but, you know, a bank will come to us and say, actually, we want to know how Nike's making it. We want, we want to know how Amazon's making it. Like what is making them tick? What is making them grow? Because that's what I'm striving for. I'm not necessarily striving to be the next TSB or Lloyd's or Bank of America. I'm striving to be Nike, right? So um, there's syndicated data streams and solutions that can, you know, add to um, your understanding of how your distinctive assets are laddering up, laddering back, and also working with a good qual a, a, a consultant that also understands the importance of that. Um, because that's that's key too. Sometimes research partners are too focused on the research, not necessarily on the those business objectives, right? Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I um, I was thinking back to uh, have you seen the System One analysis of the uh, Christmas adverts? Because they talk, within that they talk about like the um, how effective it is from in terms of distinctiveness. You know how distinct those Christmas yeah. adverts are, and whether you know straight away whether it's John Lewis or or Marks and Spencer yes. or what have you. Um, yeah, yeah, we we've we've done some some similar work. I mean, System One is all about pretesting, right? And and we do it kind of live in context, and uh, and and yeah, we we've seen how actually even for big brands, when you when you don't lean into your distinctiveness, which is very different than your differentiation, right? When yeah. you don't lean into that, um, you're kind of cannibalizing on what you've grown, right? And and we saw that in some of the Christmas ads from last year, and we'll see what comes out this year too. So how do how do creatives you know you're you're sat there in the creative department uh, and you've got to come up with an ad like how much how much would you put into doing the research beforehand versus you know running an idea uh, a, you know a basic concept a minimal viable product if you like of your of your concept and then testing it or or do you just go right we're going to make another Christmas ad and here it is and oh it didn't work like like yeah. I, this comes down to, I think, a lot of like budget and time, right? Um, there's a lot of thoughts about pretesting, the value of pretesting, or the 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 lack of value of it. Because I do think that things in context can be viewed and can be seen very very differently. Um, I do think that there's still a need to do some sort of testing, especially if you are maybe. Um, changing your brand slightly, or you're doing something a little bit, you know, out of the box. Um, it's always good to get kind of feedback. We've seen a lot of companies get it really wrong, right? Budweiser, you know, Pepsi was one of those brands at one point too with Kendall Jenner. Yeah. Um, but it can be it, it can be pricey. 
um, you know, if you're doing pre-testing and you're going to be doing live testing, right? So it does kind of come down to budget and also your ability to be agile. Because if you're a giant company, um, it's really unlikely that you're going to completely reshoot or like change your campaign, right? You might, but what you may do is pull it and then repurpose something you did before. But if you're a smaller business, you might not have the budget to do that. So again, I think it comes back to, okay, what would happen if we did pre-testing and this came back as like a total flop? Are we going on intuition, right? Like we did for the euros or are we changing it? And what is it going to cost me to do both that pre-testing and change? Or are we going to launch this live? And what happens if it's a flop? Are we going to pull it? Are we going to repurpose it? Are we going to change it? So you really have to think about what are you going to do with that knowledge? Because once you know, you cannot unknow, right? Yeah. Um, but also some creatives work really well on some channels and then don't work really well on others. So something that works well um, in TV just might not be landing on social and vice versa. So I think it really comes down to your budget, your ability to be agile, um, and you know how how committed you are probably to the both the short and long term of that. We see a lot too with with creative that it might be working really well, but it wears out fast. You know, we saw that with one of the Super Bowl ads last year, and you know, it, it was with Anna Kendrick, and everybody was super excited about Anna Kendrick, and then literally within two weeks, they're like, "Can she shut up? We don't want to hear her anymore. She is annoying me, right?" And so these things happen in context. You see the commercial or you get the ad five times and you're like, I, I'm done with it. So it, it, it does come down to what you're, what you're willing to do. Um, I always think that doing some sort of testing is better than, than not, but I would always err on doing live testing um, versus pre-testing unless you are really drastically like changing something and maybe you're going out with the messaging that's like, eh. um, but either way, get some internal feedback too, right? Like there are, there's a lot of creative that I've seen gone out and maybe they pre-test, maybe they didn't, but I have to wonder, did anybody, did, did nobody see this it was a glaring issue? <laughs> so like get some sort of feedback, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. So one, one very final uh, oh. question. Uh, I, I know that the community always love uh, a resource, a go-to, uh, a recommended book. Uh, like, what's what's your what's the if you were to go right? I'm just gonna. It's my first step into the world of of research. Uh, is there a is there a publication or is there a a person other than your good self uh, to follow on LinkedIn or like where where would you go for for some sort of uh, basic principles on on research? Okay, um, book how brands grow. Print, you know. We all got to read that book, 100%. Um, the IPA is a phenomenal resource for marketers of all levels. Um, we do a lot of work with the IPA, um, kind of measuring, you know, best in practice um, tools and effectiveness, but we're constantly learning from that resource. Work, there's a, a ton of amazing content that's that's pushed out through, through work. Um, if you are a super nerd like me, you may really find, and, and maybe you're in a, a retail space or, or your products are in retail space, um, Semiotics, The Semiotics of Retail by Dr. Rachel Laws. She's one of my great friends and she blows my mind every time I, I read any of her content. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think work, the IPA, um, I like to talk about women in research. Of course, I, I lead that practice here in, in New York, um, but it is a global organization. Um, go go to some of their events, see what people are talking about. That's amazing. Absolutely, like brilliant session. And thank you, thank you so much. I think uh, the folks that are in uh, listening at the moment, uh, you're probably really going to, if you enjoyed this session, you're going to really enjoy next week's. Uh, it's a chap called Mark Smith, who was, I think he was like head of brand at Molson Coors. Um, he's spoken um, for us in the Birmingham Marketing Meetup. He has a brain the size of a fridge. And it is absolutely fascinating to hear that guy talk about um, uh, what, what, whatever he's going to talk about. His, his talk is actually on how to build a budget that gives you clarity next week. Uh, and Ooh, that will also be our final webinar of the year. So I want it to be a big one. Um, and I think it's going to be it's going to be great. 
Um, but Dana, like so lovely to meet you. So lovely that you took the time to to give so much to our community. Um, do make sure you go and uh, follow Dana on LinkedIn. I'll send you the links afterwards. Yes. But, um, and yeah, we've got a bunch. Of, I can send you the questions afterwards. You'll probably have LinkedIn contact yes. days. Send me the questions. Um, send them all. Yeah. Connect with me. Email me. I love to grow our network. Um, you know, as somebody who's part of the Marketing Academy here, part of a lot of things globally. I'm in London a lot. Um, so would love to connect with everybody. And thank you, James. And, and tell Joe said thank you as well. It's been yeah, really we'll fun. Do. We'll do. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Dana. Cheers, guys. See you guys.